My name is Dr. Ben Gotchman. I'm Chief of Engagements at NORAD US NORTHCOM. And thank you for the opportunity for us to present today. We are very pleased to present. We have uh, distinguished speakers on the panel. Number A, US Coast Guard and Canadian perspective on Arctic security and the involving threat environment. And before I present, I just like to thank, uh, we would like to thank um, the op the opportunity, um, the Marine Corps University, Norwegian Defense University College, Marine Corps University Foundation. Um, thank you for hosting our panel today. Um, all the opinions expressed here are those of the individual and do not necessarily reflect the views of the Marine Corps University or Norwegian University College um, or any other agency of the US or Norwegian government. We will be recording this panel for the benefit of those in our community of interest who could not join us today. So we ask that you be mindful of keeping your microphones muted to avoid disrupting the presentation, as well as to turn your own webcams off to help us stream smoothly. At the conclusion of our guest presentation, we will have a question and answer session. So if you have a question, please type it in the group chat and we will ask the question to the panel on your behalf. Please note that we will only accept questions via WebEx chat and that the Facebook live stream will not be active for the question and answer uh, portion. So um, I would like to introduce, we have three speakers today. Uh, we have Dr. Adam Lajeunus, PhD is the Irving Shipbuilding Chair in Canadian Arctic Marine Security Policy and Assistant Professor at the Brian Mulroney Institute of Government St. Francis University. He is the author of Lock, Stock, and Icebergs, 2016, A Political History of the Northwest Passage, as well as a co-author of the 2017 monograph, China's Arctic Ambitions and What They Mean for Canada, and co-editor of the Canadian Arctic Operations, 1941 to 2015, Lessons Learned, Lost, and Relearned. Our, our other speaker is Dr. Whitney Lackenbauer, who is the Network Lead Canadian Research Chair in the Study of Canadian North and Professor School for the Study of Canada, Trent University. Dr. Lackenbauer is one of Canada's leading experts on Arctic security, history, and contemporary policy. Um, so we were very pleased to have him uh, speak also. And then we have another speaker who is uh, uh, Captain McCabe from the U.S. Coast Guard. And uh, Captain McCabe currently serves as Chief of Response Operations for Coast Guard District 17, where he oversees operations across the entire Alaska region, including the Arctic and North Pacific high seas. Captain McCabe most recently served as Commanding Officer of U.S. Coast Guard Midget, uh, the Coast Guard's newest national security cutter put into active service. So those are her three speakers for today. I'd like to give start with some bullet points uh, to kind of give the NORTHCOM homeland defense perspective. NORAD and US NORTHCOM has the watch and stands ready to defend our homelands and protect the populations of the United States and Canada every day. The Arctic is re-emerging as a growing theater for strategic competition from both Russia and China. The Arctic region is an avenue of approach to North America for air, space, land, and maritime threats directly over the pole and in and through Canada. Our adversaries are actively searching for ways to hold Canada and the U.S. at risk and exploit any opportunity where they perceive weakness. Arctic surveillance and rapid response capabilities are therefore critical providing a critical, credible deterrence to new and emerging threats that may hold North America at risk. The U.S. Coast Guard had led in the Arctic both operationally and strategically for over 135 years, and uh, the 2019 U.S. Coast Guard Arctic Strategic Outlook identifies three overarching lines of effort, enhanced capability to operate effectively in a dynamic Arctic, 
strengthen the rules-based order, and innovate and adapt to promote resilience and prosperity. And the U.S. Coast Guard is not only an operational force leader in the Arctic, but also a strategic leader. This includes promoting cooperation and collaboration to position the U.S. as a preferred partner through leadership in multilateral forums, such as the Arctic Council, the Arctic Coast Guard Forum, and the International Maritime Organization. So, uh, Captain McCabe, are you ready to brief? Sir. Yeah, Doctor, uh, do you have me? Yeah, we have you and we have your slides up. So we have your first slide okay. up. All right, fantastic, uh, Dr. Gutsman. Thank you for the introduction. It's it's a real honor to be here with you and it's especially an honor to be here with my other panelists. Uh, when you're on a panel with three other doctors, it's, it can be a little intimidating and I certainly hope to uh, raise my IQ a little bit through this process, but it's great to have uh, all of us here together today. I'm glad you touched a little bit on the history of, of the United States Coast Guard in the Arctic because I often remind people that we used to do a lot more Arctic. So we're kind of coming back full circle. You know, as most people know, we bought Alaska from Russia back in 1867, and then we sent the first revenue cutter up to Alaska, which was the cutter Lincoln in 1870. So since 1870, and the Revenue Cutter Service was the precursor to the United States Coast Guard. So we've been doing this a long time, but we got a lot of lessons we're, we're relearning and needing to relearn as we head back with some more focus and some more effort. So I uh, thank you for that. As you mentioned, I did uh, most recently command the Cutter Midget. And the only reason that's really a, of interest for the context of what we're going to talk about today is my last patrol on Midget, just by irony, is I was assigned to come up to Alaska and patrol in Alaska. Midget is home ported in Honolulu. My last trip was up to Alaska. And, and uniquely, I was assigned to head up through the Bering Strait into the Chuck GC, which is something we have done before with non-ice breaking ships, but we haven't done it in a long time. And we did it with a lot more focus and purpose this time. And I'll, I'll touch on that more uh, once we get into the slides. But if we could go to the uh, second slide, that'd be great. The one that says Arctic Shield on the top. And this is just yeah, a brief overview, second. really. Okay, and this is just yeah. really a brief overview to offer a bit of a spectrum of the sorts of activities that we are currently conducting in the Arctic. We internally organize under these three different task forces, and you know we're doing everything from forward deploying helicopters to Kotzebue during the ice-free months in the summer to uh, the national security sorts of missions that I'll talk much more about on the, on the next slide. And then equally as important is we're, we're pushing a lot of our missions we've always had more to the Arctic in the marine safety realm, which is really the regulatory side of the Coast Guard. And, and those folks are doing some really important work, doing facility inspections where uh, oil and petroleum products come, get delivered from the sea to shoreside, villages rely on these sorts of services, but as the perma permafrost is thawing, these facilities are becoming a little less stable, and we're trying to get a handle on that so we understand the risk of potential oil spills from land. So, so again, this, this effort's been going ongoing really for the last 10 to 13 years, but it's really picked up steam in the last few years. And again, our overarching goals in, in this realm are really to enhance our capability to operate in the Arctic, and that gets back to what I let off with. We're, we're sort of relearning lessons and expanding on previous lessons that we used to, we used to employ. Uh, we're also, very importantly, trying to strengthen the rule-based order. And, and in the Arctic, the way I look at it anyways, I think you know, there are certainly challenges, but those challenges come with opportunities. And the challenge of increased vessel traffic in the Arctic you know, the challenge is what we all expect it to be. There's there's increased security threats, whether it be uh, directly, you know, in sovereignty sorts of threats versus oil spills versus collisions versus, versus a mass rescue if you have a cruise ship get in trouble in the high north. But with those come opportunities, and especially with the rule-based rule order, we have, a, we have an opportunity, I think, we collectively to uh, establish that order and strengthen that order before it gets to the point of, uh, conflict or uh, escalation or any of that sort of thing. So really, we're trying to get this thing started on the on the right foot overall, and and 
that's what we were really trying to accomplish this summer with sort of our scheme and maneuver we use with our different ships. And the last thing we're trying to do is, is innovate and adapt so that we can promote resilience and prosperity in the Arctic. So we certainly uh, welcome any sort of growth that happens, but we want to uh, help out with our responsibilities. And that really gets back to where he's talking about with our marine safety mission to see if we can do that as safely as reasonably possible and uh, help those villages that are already plenty resilient. We, we actually have more to learn from them on the resiliency side, but as things change, they're, they're heading into some different uh, different situations that they haven't seen before as well. So, so that's just a, a quick breath of what we're dealing with. I really want to, if I could go to uh, slide three, it talks about operating in a strategically competitive space. This is really the heart of what we were trying to do this summer. And, and again, with much more deliberate action into it. What you see there is a bunch of pictures, and I'll get into those in a second, but overlaid over the Bering Strait in the Chukchi Sea. So what we, in, in the green lines you see in there are the IMO suggested routes that have been approved by the IMO, International Maritime Organization. And we routinely patrol in the Bering Sea along the maritime boundary line between the United States and Russia. And Russia does the same, not quite as much as we do, but they certainly do the same. And that line is important for economic reasons, but it's but it is high seas. So both countries can patrol on either side of that line, and that is perfectly reasonable under international law. So we wanted to extend that thought process to the Chukchi Sea to again just to establish norms that shouldn't surprise anybody. But we also very intentionally ran our ships up the western side of the Diomedes through the IMO routes, uh, which go through Russian territorial seas. And we did that not to be provocative per se, but we did it so that we could, again, just establish those norms that this is in accordance with international law, this should not surprise anyone, and we will use these routes, and we would not be surprised if the Russians use the routes on our side, uh, because they are approved, and that's what they're for. Now, we did that very deliberately. Uh, we notified Russia about our intent. We have a long-standing working relationship between the United States Coast Guard and the Russian Border Guard. It goes back to 1998, and we can pick up the phone at any time and call them directly, and we do that, and we do that routinely, and we share emails directly with them. So we, in this case, we notified them. We don't have to, but we did as a courtesy to make sure there was no surprise. And then my ship, when I was commanding officer of the midget, we were the first ship to do this. So we went up the western side. Uh, we were contacted by Russia, uh, provided a, you know an escort that I didn't need. It was not required, but that was their choice, and they did that, and we proceeded up into the Chukchi Sea. And then we, we continued to operate in the Chukchi Sea, and again, we're really trying to get after maritime domain awareness, trying to get a better handle of what type of activity is actually up there and the level of that activity in the maritime world. So we operated in the Chukchi Sea. We went as far north as about 70 degrees north up to the ice edge, and then over to Kotzebue and back to the Bering Strait area. We had planned operations to work with the Russian border guard after we transited, and we did. We did a joint operation with them, and you see a picture of that, which is number two. That is the Russian border guard ship Kamchatka. So we did communications drills with them, met up our two small boats just to say hi, and uh, did some good relationship building there. So that was a planned event. The other planned event I would jump over to number five, number four and five. We met up with our own icebreaker, the icebreaker Healy, as they were transiting the area, did some joint work with them. And then we also met up with the Canadian icebreaker, you see a picture of a number five, and that's a Sir Wilfred Laurier. And we did some combined exercises with them. Those were all planned events. The things that were unplanned were number three and number six, which were two uh, Chinese research vessels that came through the general area that we uh, wanted to make sure we understood what they were doing. And, and you know, the number three, I guess, that, that is the um, Shui Long, the picture of the Shui Long, that is an icebreaker. So we followed them up uh, and, and escorted them until they went into the ice, just to make sure we knew what they were doing when they were in waters subject to U.S. jurisdiction, easy. And they continued on their way. And then we saw them again when they came back through uh, towards the end of the season uh, when one of our other ships was up there on their way back to China. 
So we're also using a lot of C-130s up in the area for the same sorts of uh, activities. And, and the, you know, like I said, the Russians have uh, always had the possibility that they could do a similar thing on the U.S. side. And again, we view that as a positive thing as long as it, it is done in accordance with international law and as long as they don't do anything that are counter to U.S. interests. And, and that really manifests itself in the, in the area of native fishing and hunting activities, whaling activities. We want to make sure that no foreign uh, entity interferes with legal hunts that are going on. And we certainly uh, endeavor to do the same thing with our Russian counterparts to make sure we don't unintentionally uh, wander into an area where, where they have some sort of native subsistence hunting or whaling going on. So, so that's really the scheme of maneuver that we, we employed this summer. We did this again with another national security cutter later in the season, the Coast Guard Cutter Kimball, and very similar results to what you see here. And we certainly intend to do even more of this next summer. This, uh, Dr. Gottschman talked uh, briefly about NORTHCOM, Northern Command, and our relationship there. That relationship has always been good, but it has been, the, the interconnection has been tightening over the last, uh, especially over the last year and a half in a, in a very positive way. And we're working on ways that we can continue to do our Coast Guard activities, uh, but bring better awareness to NORTHCOM of what we're doing and where we're at so that there's a good integration there. I would stress that we are not trying to be the U.S. Navy. We are just trying to do that our normal statutory missions that we do. We're just trying to do them in different areas than we have recently as the ice recedes and there are different challenges and opportunities associated with that. So uh, that's, that's really what I thought I would cover today and I will stop there and uh, let the panel proceed and be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Captain McCabe. Um, what we'll do is we'll save questions for the end. I'm gonna stop sharing. And um, Adam, why, why don't you bring up your presentation and then I will say a couple of more bullets on the Canadian perspective from NORTHCOM and then we can kind of go from there. So hopefully everybody can see that. So um, before I introduce our two distinguished Canadian speakers, I just like to kind of give you some top level talking points from the NORTHCOM perspective on the Canada relationship. So Canada and the US are trusted allies and critical mission partners in the defense and security of North America and strategic partners in meeting broader regional and global security challenges. Advancing and sustaining NORAD, uh, is the linchpin of the Canadian U.S. Canis defense cooperation and is a command for, for priority of NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM. Our governments must reinvest in NORAD so we can collectively address current and anticipated threats to North America and maintain a credible deterrent. Commander NORAD can leverage this unique binational command status to encourage advocacy through both the Canadian and United States change of commands. So General Van Herc, our commander, uh, four-star U.S. Air Force General, he reports both to the Prime Minister of Canada as well as the President of the United States. Uh, U.S. NORTHCOM and Canadian Joint Operations Command have binational plans for homeland defense and support to civil authorities on both sides of the border. There's a 2006 Canis Combined Defense Plan and a 2008 Canis Civil Assistance Plan. And NORAD and U.S. NORTHCOM routinely engages with the CJOC to help advance homeland defense initiatives through the Permanent Joint Board on Defense and the Canadian-U.S. Military Cooperation Committee. So I'd like to introduce Adam. I don't know if Whitney is also on, Adam, but we yeah, have yeah. two distinguished uh, scholars yeah. in Canada who are experts on maritime <laughs> security. So I give you the Canadian perspective. Adam. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Dr. Gotchman. Can I get a quick thumbs up? Can you see my uh, presentation there? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we have a got it resize to change the video size or number of videos. Uh, here, I, I removed that, so I think we're good. Okay, good. Well, let me cover as much of this uh, as possible. In 10 minutes, I know we're pressed for time, so I'm going to do my level best to, uh, to move us through on schedule. Uh, thanks very much for having me, Dr. Gotchman. What I'm going to talk about a little bit today is uh, this fancy new ship that you can see up there in the, the title slide. 
This is the HMCS Harry Wolf, Canada's first new Arctic and offshore patrol vessel. So what I want to go over is, is not just what exactly the ship is and what it can do, but why exactly we have this and what the Canadian Navy uh, thinks of the Arctic and how it considers Arctic operations, why we built this, what we're doing with it, and what we're doing in the Arctic very generally. So I titled this presentation, it's a bit of an odd title, Projecting Power into the North American Arctic. It's odd because you traditionally don't project power into your own country. But we're projecting in a sense that Canadian military planners have long seen the Canadian North as a domestic expeditionary theater. Once again, there's a bit of a contradiction. But the reality is it's easier for us to maintain forces, or it was, to maintain forces in Afghanistan than it has been in our own Arctic for reasons of distance, weather, terrain, logistics, the Arctic is an extraordinarily difficult place to operate land forces or maritime forces. So what you see there on the left is the typical Canadian Arctic community pond inlet. Just want to show you, generally speaking, what these look like. Very small communities, very little capacity, if any capacity, to support anything beyond that community itself. So on the right there, you can see some of the infrastructure in the north. I've got blue circles around deep water ports at Nook, Churchill. They're building one in Iqaluit there in the middle. And on the, on the top there, you can see um, Nana Civic, which is a refueling facility. It's not a port. It's going to have very limited capacity, but it should be able to refuel uh, an icebreaker or a ship. So very little infrastructure, very little capacity. What this means is you've got to consider operations in the Canadian Arctic very differently than you would consider operations in, say, the Norwegian or you know, the Scandinavian Arctic more generally. When we talk about winter warfare, when NATO considers winter warfare, we think of cold response and big division size exercises up in Scandinavia. In Canada, Arctic warfare is so different. Arctic warfare or Arctic operations or presence is defined not so much by the cold weather in Canada, but by extreme logistics and distances, the trouble of doing anything. And you can see really quickly why that is. We have no roads that lead to the north, except for one in the, the far west up to Inuvik, being extended to Tuktoyaktuk. Uh, the rail network only goes to Churchill, but again, Putting anything on a ship from Churchill and getting it into, say, the Northwest Passage is, is a challenge in and of itself. Now, you can see from that map, there are air bases or airports all over the north, but many of these are very small. And logistically, you can quantify the difficulty of moving stuff into the north just by looking at the price of food that northerners have to pay. A $28 bag of grapes, a $26 you know, thing of orange juice that tells you just how hard it is to get anything into the north. And these are subsidized prices. The government of Canada subsidizes a lot of that. So moving into the north is hard. Operating in the north is hard. An Arctic response company group, group is in theory supposed to be able to operate over about four of 540 kilometers in about four days. That's sort of the full operating capacity uh, intent. And you can see that ranged out theoretically over the Arctic islands on the left there. You know, that's what 540 kilometers means. Now, the reality is moving over land to get anywhere in the north is extraordinarily expensive. It's extraordinarily difficult. On the right, you see a map of ranger patrol areas. And of course, they're very different. They're odd shapes having to do with the geography and the ice conditions. Moving over land means bringing everything with you. It means traveling light and kamatux and snowmobiles you're not going to be able to project a great deal of force anywhere in the north, even once you get in through the airports. You're kind of, uh, you're, you're moving very light forces, carrying very, very little equipment. So the Arctic is a maritime environment. If the forces are going to do anything of substance in the north, uh, if you're going to bring a large amount of kit or material, if you're going to respond to a large disaster, ideally, you're going to be doing it from, uh, from the sea. Air travel is difficult, but every community in the Canadian Arctic, at least in the, the high Arctic, is, is a maritime community. It's on the coast. And so most of the safety and security problems that we are anticipating, everything from community disasters to environmental pollution, poaching, uh, trespassing, these are all either maritime or maritime adjacent. 
concerns. Now, historically, Canada has had a very difficult time uh, dealing with this or planning for this because we haven't had the, the resources, we haven't had the platforms to deal with maritime security problems. So we've had the Coast Guard, which has a long history in the Arctic, very capable of working in the Arctic, but the reality is they're overtaxed. They've got lots of jobs. They, this isn't their, their job to deal with the security and safety uh, problems that may arise. If they are retasked to deal with poachers or trespassing or anything of that nature, uh, it's work that they're not doing on community resupply or commercial assistance. They simply don't have the capacity. The Navy has never had the kit to do it. Thin-skinned ships that can pop up for about three, four weeks um, of the year. A uh, quotation I love is from the commander of a supply ship for Tektor 1973. He says, well, he told a journalist how we operate in the north, it's like a porcupine makes love. Very carefully. Traditionally, we just have not had that capacity to reliably do anything, which is where this new asset comes in, which is where uh, the, Can the Canadian Navy is planning to build these now. This is the first one that's just off. It's just gone through Northwest Passage, but this is a 20-year process or a 15-year process to get this into the water. And you can see the direction that the Navy has gone with this compared in size to the current Kingston-class patrol ship there on the bottom. Uh, you have the nice picture of it on the top. You can see how, how big it is. It's been expanded so significantly from our old patrol ships. And the reason for this is when you're in the north, it's an expeditionary operation. You need to bring everything with you. Everything that you need, it's got to be on that ship. Fuel, uh, supplies, food, uh, kit, any soldiers, anything that needs to be projected north, whether it's Army, whether it's Environment Canada, Transport, RCMP, other government departments, everything has got to be self-contained within this one ship. It is 6,400 tons. It's bigger than our frigates. Lightly armed, but still well enough armed to deal with any kind of a constabulary issue. And the point I want to make is that this is a whole of government constabulary vessel that is, in essence, a jack of all trades. And it's a jack of all trades because what the Canadian government expects is unconventional security concerns. This is a high likelihood, but low to medium consequence. We're not talking about the Russians or the Chinese invading the North. The, the scenario we envision is safety and security. I use cruise ships as a good, really good example of what this might look like. So there you've got the Crystal Serenity from 2016. What happens if that sinks? What happens if it grounds? This is the sort of problem. It's not the Russians or the Chinese. This is what's keeping the Navy and the Coast Guard up uh, in Canada. Here, very briefly, is, is a map I've drawn up. See those red circles? That is the range to, to communities in the, in the north that uh, a ship could sink in and have its lifeboats get to the community, given their speed and fuel. So if a ship sinks outside of those red circles, those lifeboats cannot access the community, which means that they are going to be uh, debarking on the Arctic tundra, uh, maybe hundreds or thousands of, of kilometers away from, from assistance. So you're going to need that maritime capacity. You're going to need a big ship with the ability to move a lot of stuff, a lot of soldiers, and to potentially even lift people off of off of beaches. Of course, going in over the air is very difficult. Uh, 3,100 kilometers to the center of the Northwest Passage from all of our SAR, uh, SAR um, bases. It's essentially responding to a search and rescue issue that takes place in London from a base in central Turkey. And this is very real. I mean, we've had uh, cruise ships ground uh, in the, the recent past. We had the Academic Yafi, the Clipper Adventure. These are some pictures I took from the Crystal uh, Serenity, that big cruise ship I showed you recently, but 1,000 passengers, no survival training. You know, there's cowboy night going on at the top. That's some kind of Hunger Games theme party on the bottom. I'm not sure what they're doing. The point of the matter is the average age of these people is about 65. None of them are going to survive. You've got a real security problem if something happens with one of these ships. You've got other safety and security issues. You've got trespassing, poaching, environmental disasters. That's the Berserk 2. It was a Norwegian a gang ship that snuck up into the Northwest Passage, tried to debark some, some wanted uh, crew members on Victoria Island. Uh, they were eventually rescued and arrested. They were quite happy to be arrested. They were being surrounded by wolves at the time. And so the Canadian Navy has adopted this mothership approach. Big honking ship that can do a whole lot of different stuff, carry a lot of people from different government departments and project government power, control and jurisdiction across a broad spectrum of different areas 
into this very difficult to reach uh, region. So to summarize, Canada's focus has been for the last 20 years on the unconventional security and safety in the Arctic, more so than the conventional defense elements. The land forces have always been very limited in what they can do in the north, just by virtue of their inability to move very far and carry very much when they're doing it. And as such, what we've been adopting is a versatile, ice-strengthened maritime approach, which allows us to project more into the north. Now, that's not to say we're not doing a lot of the land. We certainly are, and we need to talk uh, ad nauseum about the rangers. But for the moment, what we are doing in the maritime is to approach it like a holistic whole of government problem where we can jam everything into one capable platform and we are building um well we're going to be building eight of these so with that i'm going to turn over to whitney uh hopefully we're still relatively on schedule thank you thank you uh whitney um i'd like to introduce dr p whitney lackenbauer network lead canada research chair in the study of the Canadian North and Professor's School for the Study of Canada at Trent University. So Whitney. Thanks, Dr. Gotchman. Hope you can hear me. Yes. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks to the uh, Marine Corps University. Really a privilege to be here at the symposium and also to Norwegian Defence University College for hosting this important event. I've got a bit of a tinny room that I'm in in beautiful Norwich University in Northfield, Vermont, um, where I'm participating in another symposium. Really happy to come and share some very high level strategic ideas and I'll try to keep them brief. So we have lots of time for question and answer on Arctic security. So the big theme of this symposium and I come to this topic from various perspectives and levels of analysis. First of all, I want to impress upon participants. There's often a false binary that sets up asking whether we should frame the Arctic or whether we should expect the Arctic to become a zone of conflict or cooperation. I mean, we live in a competitive world. This is a false binary. We have and we should expect cooperation and competition in the Arctic because we live in a world of similar dynamics. So competition between Arctic states and with non-Arctic states is going to continue. But this does not mean that we're equally vulnerable in or across all domains or at all scales or levels. And certainly doesn't mean that conflict is inevitable. So I like to frame it in my simple brain in, in terms of categories that are not mutually exclusive, but encourage us to categorize or really think deliberately about the nature of Arctic threats and ask what makes them Arctic. And I often frame it as, are we distinguishing between threats that pass through the Arctic, threats to the Arctic, and threats in the Arctic? Because I think there's a conceptual danger in treating all threats as the same and not being attentive to what kinds of threats we're talking about and exactly what our competitors are targeting. So when we're thinking about threats through the Arctic, uh, certainly Dr. Lajeunesse emphasized the Arctic as maritime space, obviously also airspace and aerospace. And over the Arctic, we also have outer space. These are the trajectories of ballistic missiles, certainly of strategic bombers as they have been since the 1940s. These are enduring legacy missions of NORAD that continue to be relevant today. We see next generation cruise missiles, hyperglide delivery vehicles, and other strategic delivery platforms. Why I wanna emphasize this is these are threats that pass through the Arctic. The Arctic laser will say in detecting them and potentially in the defeat side of a kill chain. But I don't think these are Arctic threats or best situated through a regional lens. They're best understood at the grand strategic level. And I'll come back to that in a bit. When I'm talking threats to the Arctic, if we're thinking about it as North American Arctic, these are threats that are emanating from outside of the North American Arctic and actually targeting the North American Arctic itself. And I think when we look at what the drivers of these threats to the Arctic are, it may belie some of these myths that I'm going to talk about in just a second. And then we need to think about threats in the Arctic, emanating from Arctic dynamics or threats within our particular spaces. So I'm going to take just a few minutes here to lay out what I see as six persistent myths about Arctic defense and security that persist today. First, the idea that Arctic state sovereignty is on thinning ice that somehow Canada and the United States are at risk of losing our Arctic territory or our sovereign rights to offshore resources because the cryosphere is changing, meaning the, the, melt, the ice is melting in the Arctic Ocean. This idea is implied in a lot of the pithy sentences that start many strategies or policy statements that bund to bundle together resurgent major power competition, 
you got climate change, you've got uncertain boundaries, increasingly accessible resources and shipping routes, and emerging technologies compressed together as drivers of rising Arctic defense concerns. But I'm gonna stress that conflict emanating from growing major power competition at the global scale that spills over into the Arctic is a very different set of threats than thinking about those sovereignty threats in the Arctic as being causes of conflict. Long-standing, well-managed, comparatively minor disputes or differences of legal position in the Arctic certainly don't keep me up at night. And I wanna emphasize the need to be more precise in identifying which type of threats in which domains or across which domains are heightening the risk of conflict and which aspects of these threats are specifically Arctic and which ones we need to best manage at the global strategic level. And I think that Arctic states like the US needs to adopt more coherent and precise strategic messaging about the nature of this changing Arctic security environment. The second threat as I see it is that climate change and access to resources and uncertainty over Arctic boundaries are driving the hard security agenda in the North American Arctic right now in this era of great power competition. I'd suggest to you it's dynamics outside of the circumpolar Arctic that are really driving competition and amplifying the risk of miscommunication or unintended escalation. So I see strong analytic value in distinguishing between these threats passing through or over the Arctic. Bombers, missiles, glide vehicles that pass through airspace or aerospace or space above the Arctic, or vessels passing through Arctic waters, either on top or submerged, distinguishing between these threats than those that are from the Arctic or threats to the Arctic arising from Arctic regional dynamics. So I'm gonna suggest that the dominant variables in play right now are grand strategic rather than regional ones. And the key is actually technology in the form of faster, more maneuverable delivery systems and vulnerabilities in the cyber and influence domains. Hyperglide weapons, the latest generation of cruise missiles are not affected by changing Arctic environmental conditions, nor is the ability for adversaries to try and polarize debate using social media or cyberspace or their state controlled news media. Third thing is I've been talking about the Arctic as if it's a single space, but really I wanna emphasize the Arctic is not a single geostrategic theater. There are important differences between the Eurasian Arctic, the European Arctic, the North American Arctic, right? Vast distances between them in certain domains that make it essential that we not get caught up in generalizing about Arctic threats as if those in one part of the Arctic are the same everywhere. The immediate threats posed by the Russian army to its European Arctic neighbors with shared land borders, for example, are different than those threats that the Russians pose to the United States or Canada. And we need to think about the Bering Strait and the Greenland, Iceland, UK, Norway gap as access routes to the North Pacific and the North Atlantic, right? Which may have more significance for countries like China to get their way out of dilemmas, like the Malacca dilemma, right? To find a way out of Asia if they're, if they're locked in. This might be more significant than looking at these through a circumpolar and around the North Pole type lens. Fourth myth, that the Russians have aspirations to conquer Arctic territory from rival states, that their preponderance of icebreakers, their expanding footprint of bases and units, their self-perception as the foremost Arctic nation means they think they could win in Arctic military conflict. Sure, Russia wants to flex its Arctic muscles for strategic effect. The Kremlin knows it cannot win an Arctic war. And Russian officials admit that the US and NATO are militarily superior. They cannot win in a conventional peer-to-peer -peer conflict. So I think we really need to think about hybrid below the threshold and geopolitical spaces first and foremost when we're thinking about Russia as an Arctic competitor. The fifth myth is China is a peer competitor in the Arctic. It's a competitor to Arctic states in several respects, but it is not a peer. And serious analysts in China recognize this, as does their Arctic policy released in 2018. So yes, China promotes itself as a near Arctic state, but this invented status doesn't give it any priority over any other non-Arctic state actor in terms of international rights or access. And I think we need to be careful not to dedicate disproportionate attention to China's potential Arctic aspirations in say the maritime domain, if this means redirecting resources away from areas where we are certain, certain that China has poor strategic interests, capabilities and revisionist intentions like the South China Sea. The last one, and I'll be quick, Dr. Gottschman, is the myth that the Arctic is somehow exceptional in the world of international affairs. This idea actually takes several forms. The classic one is that the Arctic is uniquely peaceful and cooperative and that it should be and can be kept separate from broader international dynamics. This is naive. It's naive in a globalized world. And I think that the ideal 
of a purely exceptional cooperative Arctic space is in much greater danger than actual peace and stability is in the circumpolar world. Another form of exceptionalism is that the Arctic is somehow exceptionally vulnerable or becoming exceptionally unstable and explosive. This kind of thinking tends to overlook or forget the broader grand strategic implications that such moves would have for all the different actors and protagonists. So climate change is amplifying certain types of Arctic threats in certain domains, and it's certainly changing the face of the region for its inhabitants and for the international community, but it does not mean that the heightened international interest and even competition is inherently going to negate cooperation and bring about conflict. It's how we're mature in our approaches to navigate an inherently competitive environment and make sure that we're able as North American allies to seize the advantage. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Whitney. It's a pleasure. So we're almost out of time. So um, I just like to wrap it up by thanking our panel members, uh, Captain Alan McCabe, um, Dr. Adam Lajeunesse, and Dr. P. Whitney Lackenbauer for participating in this panel today. I would also like to thank um, Colonel Brian Cole, Joint Warfare Course Director, Professor of Military Studies at the Marine Corps War College for inviting us to this event today. And I'd also like to thank um, the Marine Corps University, Norwegian Defense University College, Marine Corps University Foundation uh, for participating um, and sponsoring this great symposium. So thank you very much. On behalf of NORAD Northcom, I'd like to thank you all for allowing me to moderate the panel today. We look forward to future panels with this distinguished group. So thank you very much. Take care.